quote, tonight on Dateline, she had a full life all posted on Facebook. It was a clue to her death there too. She opened up her boutique. She had gone to Europe. She was going out dancing at night. She was excited. She was taking lots of pictures and posts on social media. She goes, I think somebody's breaking into my Facebook. I also think somebody's breaking into my house. She felt like she had a stalker. Immediately, I haven't heard uh, from my daughter since Tuesday. Inside the apartment, there's blood stains on the carpet and blood spatter on the wall. And she's missing. And she's missing. They find a notebook. It says, I'll have great pleasure tearing her apart. The hairs on your neck, stand up. I just went, oh my god, you gotta look into this guy. My world had ended. He was so good at pretending he's a monster.
husband got a call. I was at work, and she's just crying. It was his sister, LaJoya's mom. LaJoya didn't show up. And she's like, I'm worried, because she knew she was coming. She actually sent for her. You call LaJoya. No answer. Exactly. You're texting her. She's not at home. No. David left work to collect his younger niece. He was perplexed. I was hoping she just was somewhere and would show up and say, you know what, I'm sorry. I was doing this or doing that. I thought she just lost track of time. And, you know, and we do that. Because like I said, she was juggling the boutique the work, and I figured, well, maybe, you know what, she lost track of time. Well, according to social media, LaJoya might have been juggling something else. Just a week before, she had posted a message on Facebook that read, okay, he made me breakfast and has a rooftop pool. He's a keeper. The man in the photograph? David and Alicia had no clue. When I seen that, I'm like, okay, She's back in a relationship. I'm hoping this one is a good one. The way the picture looked, I'm like, what is he, a record producer? Or, you know, I didn't know what he did. But I'm like, maybe they took a flight somewhere. Or, I don't know. One day passed, then two days. Still no sign of LaJoya. On Friday, June 12th, 2015, her mom called the Monrovia Police Department. I'm thinking that she might be sick or unconscious in her apartment. She was worried because she knew things about LaJoya. The police did not. It was something one of LaJoya's friends knew too. When we come back. She goes, I think somebody is breaking into my Facebook. Even scarier, was someone breaking into her house? She goes, I know for sure that I'm leaving some stuff somewhere and when I'm coming home, it's somewhere else. Huh? What makes you think that? 
She goes, I know if I know for sure that I'm leaving some stuff somewhere. And when I'm coming home, it's somewhere else. LaJoya said things weren't just moved around. Some of them were missing. The first thing that came into my mind is like, you're under a lot of stress. You know, it's easy to forget, you know, where you leave things or misplace things. You know, I told her it happens to all of us. I think you're just a little stressed. Now, LaJoya was missing. After her mom called Monrovia PD, they went to LaJoya's apartment. Blinds were drawn. They couldn't see in the windows. Checked the door. Door was locked. Sergeant Chad Harvey was a detective back in 2015. He says patrol officers found LaJoya's apartment locked and secure. Couldn't find anything suspicious, anything out of the normal. It looked normal. So everything looked normal at the time. So they went ahead and contacted LaJoya's mother and told her nothing seems peculiar and left it at that. LaJoya's mom wasn't alone. That night, police heard from other worried friends and family. I texted her and last night and she did not respond. I have an employee that hasn't reported to work. Officers went back for a second look. They started talking to some neighbors. Nothing really seemed out of the ordinary again. Police called LaJoya's ex, Jose Turner, the father of their two children. He said the last time he saw LaJoya was the previous weekend when he dropped off the kids at her place. A few days later, he picked up the kids as usual. Police also called LaJoya's cell phone carrier, who told them LaJoya's cell was active that day. When LaJoya's mom heard that, she told police she would hold off on filing a missing persons report. Maybe LaJoya would contact her. So we waited a few days. As Friday night drew to a close, news about LaJoya's disappearance was already making the rounds. LaJoya's sister Brianna heard it from her grandmother. She said it very nonchalant. She just told me that LaJoya hasn't talked to my mom in a few days. And me knowing LaJoya, I felt like maybe she just wanted some space. It wasn't uncommon for her to like disconnect from time to time. Eva remembered a conversation she'd had with LaJoya a week before. She told me that she wanted to, you know, just escape. She found a place in like a retreat in Arizona, no cell phones, whatever, meditation and whatnot. I told I think it's a great idea. I think it's gonna help you gather your thoughts. LaJoya had a lot to think about. Earlier that week, she'd gone to happy hour with her friend Bernadette, who sometimes helped out with LaJoya's clothing boutique. They talked about LaJoya's decision to close her store due to financial problems. Despite that setback, Bernadette said she didn't see any signs LaJoya wanted to escape, unplug, or vanish. Things are okay now because she closed the store, so now she has that stress off of her. She was very positive about the future. She even posted this video of herself dancing in the boutique just days before the doors closed for good. So where was she? LaJoya's brother called Luther, even though they'd never met, to ask if he'd heard from LaJoya. In fact, he had, Luther told him, but that was a few days ago. After that call, Luther said he went by LaJoya's apartment. I went to see if I'd seen her car out there, but I didn't. Because her parking space was like in the back and like to the side right there. So Luther said he didn't knock on her door. It had now been nearly a week since LaJoya had gone silent. With a clock ticking loudly in her head, LaJoya's mom again called police. Officers made a third trip to LaJoya's apartment. And this time, they forced their way in. And what they found was a crime scene. Coming up, I noticed that there's blood stains on the carpet. What had happened? And where was LaJoya? The answer just might be on video. A neighbor put up a motion camera. That camera was faced at the perfect position. When Dateline continues. Yelled for LaJoya, no answer. 
Detective Harvey opened the front door for his partner. As we did, we entered, still announcing our presence. Nobody was inside. What's it look like in there? It's clean. Doesn't look like anything out of the normal. Some clothes lying around, just normal everyday things. Then they looked in the main bedroom, where it didn't look normal at all. I noticed that there's blood stains on the carpet. I then noticed blood stains on the mattress and blood spatter on the wall. And all of LaJoya's bedding was gone. And she's missing. Well, uh, you've been doing this a while. Uh, what are the odds that that person who was missing is still alive? We like to think that they are. We don't know that they aren't. In L.A. County, a small department like Monrovia often turns to the sheriff's department for a possible murder case like this one. That evening, Detective Eddie Brown and his partner were on call. We got called from our residence, and we go straight to the location. Brown scanned LaJoya's apartment. The kids' room was uh, totally disheveled. The drawers were taken out. Some of them were on the floor. Some of them were partially open. Uh, clothing, materials on the floor. It looked a mess. LaJoya's car was gone, and detectives noticed her purse and phone were missing too. Had someone robbed the apartment and taken LaJoya with them? Detective Brown didn't think so. There was no forced entry. Oh, somebody can push their way in. If he did that, why would he take the bed sheets if something didn't occur? Uh, if this is a push-in bad guy and he disables her or kills her, He's gonna leave her right there. He's gonna steal what he's gonna steal and leave and her right there. No reason to take her body. Right. Brown believed the most likely scenario was that someone staged the scene to look like a robbery, which meant LaJoya was probably the target. Because the woman's bed sheets were gone, which I believe that was used to transport her out of the house. So she was either knocked out, unconscious, or dead. The apartment also smelled like bleach. Which tells me that someone probably tried to clean the crime scene. And then came a lead. Was there a video record of what had happened? A neighbor directly across from her apartment was having a problem with some petty theft. So he decided to put up a motion camera. And it's the type of camera that, you know, it has to be activated by a, a sensor, so an animal or a person walking by. And that camera was faced at the perfect position. Investigators downloaded the neighbor's video. You don't usually get that lucky. No. That's why I was very excited about this camera, especially when I started watching the video, because you could see the door clear as, clear as a bell. Brown watched that video for hours. I keep playing it over and over and open to see her being carried out of that apartment. That's what he wanted to see, but it wasn't there. Her door is too far away uh, for the motion to activate the camera. So you're lucky, but you're unlucky. But yeah, I needed a cat to walk past there. At just the right time. At just the right time. No cat. And still no LaJoya McCoy. Police put out a bulletin for a silver Toyota Camry, LaJoya's car. And hours after the alert went out, a patrol officer found it, not far from her apartment, parked in a residential neighborhood. A parking ticket had been wedged into the door frame, and there was something inside. The passenger and driver's windows were tinted. The officer took a closer look and he saw it. It was a body. Coming up. I just felt like my world had ended. LaJoya's loved ones get terrible news, and investigators make a discovery. That's got to make everybody sit up a little taller in the saddle. That's a red flag for us, yes. Was a female body. 
She's on the passenger side of the driver's passenger side. Passenger side, which tells us clearly that the perpetrator drove her to this location. She had a, a ligature mark around her neck. News spread quickly. A candlelight vigil was held at LaJoya's apartment. NBC station KNBC was there. Throughout the night, more and more gathered. Word spread. LaJoya McCoy was not missing anymore. I just felt like my world had ended. It was tough. Her aunt and uncle kept hoping it was all some kind of mistake. It's not going to be her. They're going to say she's okay or it was somebody else. You know, she's a mother. She's a sister. She's a daughter. Who would want to do this to her? I, I, I just couldn't understand it. They couldn't think of anyone who had an issue with LaJoya, except maybe the father of her children, Jose Turner. She moved on, and I think he didn't like that. According to Alicia, Jose would sometimes do things to spite LaJoya, like the times he'd pick up the kids from the youth center without letting LaJoya know about it. He's just kind of being a pain. It's a jerk. Yeah, it's a jerk. You know, try, but, trying to make her mad. Yeah, and it was definitely, a, a, no, it had to be some envy in here. Bernadette thought the same. I believe that he became very jealous um, of LaJoya um, after a while. Because her life was going somewhere, and his kind of wasn't. Right. I believe he was an inspiring actor that really wasn't getting many offers. And there was something else that bothered David and Alicia. The day after LaJoya didn't show up to meet her younger sister at the bus station, Jose showed up at their house with the kids. And during that visit, they say, not once did Jose ask about LaJoya. No matter what was going on between them, that's the mother of his kids. Yes, and that's why I didn't understand it. Like, why? You're, you're that selfish of a person? Of course, Detective Eddie Brown heard all these stories about Jose, including a comment Jose had made to the Monrovia PD the second time they called him while LaJoya was still missing. Mr. Turner said, I'm going to stop answering any questions and you can talk to my lawyer. That's got to make everybody sit up a little taller in the saddle. That's a red flag for us, yes. Well, there was another side to Jose. Tammy Devine was a journalist and aspiring filmmaker who got to know Jose and La Joya. I remember seeing uh, La Joya and Jose with their kids together, and I was like, oh my goodness. I wish that, you know, I was cool, calm, and collected like these guys are. There was um, kindness there. Jose respected La Joya, said Tammy. And Detective Brown knew that just because Jose had clammed up, that didn't mean he was a killer. We didn't zero in uh, on him, uh, and we can't. You know, initially in an investigation, everybody is a suspect. We look at everything, you know, and, and everybody. Tips started coming into police. One from a local chiropractor who'd seen the news reports about La Joya. He told detectives he met LaJoya and a friend of hers at a restaurant about a week earlier. Turns out that was the night Bernadette was out with LaJoya. Detectives reviewed the restaurant's security cameras and there was the chiropractor. He's seen talking with LaJoya and later leaving the restaurant. LaJoya and her friend leave a couple of minutes later. Doesn't look like anybody's following her and she doesn't look like she's having trouble with anybody on her way out of the restaurant or way to the car. Correct. So whatever happened doesn't happen there. Correct. The chiropractor was one of the last people to see LaJoya alive, but his story was corroborated by what detectives saw on the security cameras. He was nothing more than a helpful citizen. And then there was something LaJoya had left behind. Something in her own words. We locate her journals. Her journals tell us a lot. Uh, we find out that uh, 
there was a boyfriend she had had before, and there was a new man she was falling for. And I remember reading that she had met somebody and that she was looking forward to seeing him again. Was it the man she had posted about on Facebook just days before she went missing? Detectives needed more. And we do a warrant on her phone. We do get the return on her phone. LaJoya's cell phone record showed that on the evening she was out with Bernadette, the last time LaJoya was seen alive, she was texting with someone. And the last person to be in contact with LaJoya was not Jose Turner. Nope. Coming up, investigators head back to the scene of the crime, hoping to smoke out a suspect. I did that on purpose, that location, so that he would be uncomfortable. And then, they spring their trap. He's like, do you have a suspect? I said, yes. And he said, who? And I said, you. When Dateline continues. criminal investigation, a person's digital footprint can be as valuable as their actual fingerprints. Unfortunately, in this case, LaJoya McCoy's cell phone was nowhere to be found. It last pinged several miles away from her home. And in that area, there's a lot of dumpsters. There's a lot of dumpsters. Never find the phone. Never find the phone. The or bedding. the bedding. Or her purse. Hers. Nothing. Detectives were able to obtain LaJoya's cell phone records. They discovered the cell number that LaJoya last texted belonged not to her ex, Jose Turner, and not to the new guy with the rooftop pool, but to LaJoya's friend, Luther Walls, the guy who'd helpfully driven by her apartment to check on her. Like LaJoya, Luther owned a boutique. Brown and his partner found him there. When we were speaking with uh, Mr. Walls, first name Luther, correct? Correct. He said that they had been involved romantically, but now they were just friends. Correct. My experience is that when guys say that, what they mean is, I wanted to be involved romantically, and she wanted to be just friends. Yeah, that's probably, that's what I took, you know, out of that too, but I didn't want to push that. Luther knew what was coming. I knew they was going to probably go through text messages, and I knew that I was probably was allowed the last text messages. She said, Luther had kept the texts he'd received from LaJoya, and he shared them with Detective Brown. You get a good vibe off Luther. I did. You know, doing this job for a long time, you, you can tell generally uh, when someone's lying. He didn't seem to be lying. Not at all. Detectives came to believe Luther Walls had nothing to do with LaJoya's murder. You can tell by his phone that he wasn't at her apartment. Correct. Instead, Luther helped detectives with an understanding of what was going on with LaJoya just prior to her disappearance, because Luther had heard some of the same stories LaJoya had told her mom and her friend Eva. She had expressed concerns that someone could be stalking her. And who was that? She never told me exactly who. Even without a name, Luther did know exactly who LaJoya was talking about. She did tell me if something, somebody did do something to me. Check her baby daddy. And that was Jose Turner. She told me that he was abusive. Like, she didn't really go into details, but okay. she did tell me he was abusive. I think it was more like a, a controlling relationship. Luther also told detectives that LaJoya believed Jose had a locksmith make a key to her apartment while she wasn't there. I believe uh, her sixth sense of fear was kicking in. This and was a woman who knew she was in danger. She knew she was in danger, yes. She knew. Just not in time. Correct. Which, unfortunately, I've seen that occur a lot in my career. And perhaps this was about the time in the investigation when Jose Turner's sixth sense was kicking in. Because Jose picked up the phone and called Monrovia PD. The call was recorded. I want to be able to pick up some things for the kids, if, if that's possible. Kids' games and things he said that were still in LaJoya's apartment. Monrovia PD told Jose to call the detectives, and when Brown's phone rang, 
he saw an opportunity. I, I want to get my kids' clothes or some of their belongings. Is that not possible? I understand. Yeah, but yeah, but we need to talk to you about your whatever happened to your ex, I, the baby's I, 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 baby's I mom. I don't, I don't know. I don't have anything to say about that, sir. Well, you're not, you're not, you're not concerned about it. I didn't say that. The detective told Jose he would be happy to meet with him. What about, I don't know, 1.30 at the, the apartment? At the apartment? I did that on purpose, that location, uh, so that he would be uncomfortable. And so they met at the scene of the crime. So when you meet him there, how does he seem? Like a suspect. Detective Brown had a surprise for Jose. He would hand over the kids things, sure, but he wanted something in return. And I also was gonna get a DNA swab from him. And I told him that and I showed him the paperwork. Which was a search warrant. And here we are, and here's our swab, and so open your mouth. Exactly. Brown also had a question for Jose. I said, Jose, how come you haven't asked anything about La Joya? You don't, you don't wanna know about the investigation or anything. And, he, oh, yes, uh, yeah, he said, uh, how's now, the investigation? Now that you bring it up, I do. Yeah, he's like, well, do you have a suspect? And I said, uh, yes. And he said, who? And I said, you. They submitted Jose Turner's DNA to the lab. And they waited while LaJoya's family and friends mourned. It was very hard very hard sitting there. It shouldn't have happened. We shouldn't have been at her funeral. And at the funeral with LaJoya's kids was Jose Turner. To see him there was disturbing. Just acting like nothing, nothing happened. Like nothing. David and Alicia knew something had happened. They'd seen it with their own eyes. Coming up, an eerie conversation it was like i was speaking with lajoya could a single phone call crack this case that's the missing piece yes Jail tonight in Temple City. 47-year-old Jose Roberto. 
Roberto Turner, arrested this morning on suspicion of killing his ex-girlfriend, 31-year-old LaJoya McCoy. LaJoya's mom, Summer, found it hard to accept. Her mom didn't want to believe it, of course, because that's the... that's her grandkid's father. No one wants to believe that. Least of all, a woman who came forward to say that long before LaJoya McCoy, she knew exactly what Jose Turner was capable of. Jose was so good at pretending. When, we're in, when we go in public, everything is wonderful. He's mannered. He's respectful. When we get home, he's a monster. Her name was Adrian, Jose's ex-girlfriend from years ago. She came forward when she learned Jose had been arrested. Detective Brown recorded her interview. He beat me so bad, I ran out the house naked. You see, he kept me naked. I had to stay naked, that way he don't go out the house. For Adrian, LaJoya's story was like a bad memory. I felt sick, like that could have been me. I'm, you know, that could have been me. It was like I was speaking with LaJoya. The stories were that similar? Yes. In summer 2017, Jose went on trial for LaJoya's murder. When you take this to a jury, you want to be able to prove it beyond any possible doubt. Veteran prosecutor Fernanda Barreto said the evidence was overwhelming. A blood-soaked note found in LaJoya's car, in her own writing, documenting Jose's stalking. That read, I get a flat tire after he says he's in my area. Jose Turner's DNA at the scene of the crime. Plus, the jury heard from Jose's former girlfriend, Adrian, whose own story echoed LaJoya's. And there was one more thing. Those items missing from LaJoya's apartment? Detectives found them in Jose's car. Along with this, a green notebook with notes in Jose's writing. They find almost a stream of conscious writing event session on this one page and it's um says you know i'll have great pleasure tearing her apart jose's defense the writing was fiction he was after all an actor and playwright as for jose's dna at the crime scene his attorney argued there was no way of knowing how and when it got there jurors didn't buy it after just eight hours of deliberation they found Jose Turner guilty of first-degree murder. His sentence, 26 years to life. I was heartbroken, yet very relieved that my sister got justice. Looking back on LaJoya's story, there is one obvious fork in the legal road. That night she said Jose choked her and she ran to her uncle's house. How is Jose not locked up that night? She didn't call the police, and she didn't want the police involved. Because she thinks that'll make it worse? Yes, and she's not wrong. I have cases where the women call the police, they, um, they agree to, to prosecute, and they end up being murdered. So what is the right way? I wish I knew. LaJoya did do her best to move on. She was acutely aware of the danger in front of her, um, but she just hoped that he wouldn't go that far. She hoped that he would not take that ultimate step and kill her. It's crazy when all you have going for you is hoping. I don't disagree. I think that she started reaching out to people towards the end when his behavior was escalating. In fact, detectives say her murder came just a few days before an appointment LaJoya had made with a security company to have an alarm system installed at her apartment. Today, LaJoya's aunt and uncle have become parents all over again. LaJoya's two children came to live with them. We adopted them, so they're our kids. And how are they? They're doing well, I mean, you wonder what's going through their mind. David and Alicia say that when LaJoya disappeared, Jose told the kids she had abandoned them. You've told them the truth about what happened to her. They ask in certain ways, and then when I tell them I, I won't hide anything from you, I'll tell you as much as I can. I mean, the oldest son, he told me 
My dad tricked us, huh? And I said, yeah, he did. Your dad didn't tell you the truth, but we will. Yes, yes. The truth about a woman who never gave up on herself or the future she wanted. That's all for now. I'm Lester Holt. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.